Good morning. Good morning. A warm welcome to each one of you, and special welcome to any visitors who may be worshipping with us. There will be tea and coffee after the service through this door or through the back. And to that main hall, please come along for a cup of tea or a biscuit. Um, there are not many intimations. Uh, all of the important things are at the back of your order of service that the sheep you should have. Um, uh, apart from one thing that I need to mention, and uh, that is, uh, how many of you know Kazakh Convention or at least heard of it? Kazakh Convention. That's, an, you know, the latest thing that's been happening for well over 120 years, or 40 years, right? Uh, but um, they also bring this you kind know, of smaller convention, if you like, to, to various parts of Britain. Um, one is happening in Motherwell, Mother happens also in uh, Air area, Ayrshire area. The one in uh, Motherwell is in, in a couple of weeks' time, um, uh, and that uh, usually happens uh, in St. Andrews, uh, uh, there in Motherwell, DL and St. Andrews. Um, and so if you want to, uh, I would encourage you to, to go to, because there's wonderful teaching, you know, people who come and uh, bring these uh, teachings that are really well-known and uh, well their people. So it's happening from 12th of September, 12th, 13th, and 14th, 14th of September, every night, half past seven. Um, if you would like to go, please do uh, go along. And there are, uh, I think they're asking you to have free tickets, and if you want information, I'm going to put this there and you can have the information. Um, other than that, I don't have a, um, anything else to intimate, so let's turn to worship. Our call to worship is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 100 and 5, and I believe the wording will appear up on the screen. But if you want to follow your few Bibles, please turn to page 601. Psalm 105, first four verses. Give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his greatness, tell the nations what he has done. Sing praise to the Lord, tell of the wonderful things he has done. Be glad that we belong to him, let all who worship him rejoice. Go to the Lord for help and worship him continually. Let us worship God as Scriptures say and sing the first hymn on our hymn sheet, uh, mission case number 991, I will worship.
few others are somewhere, somewhere doing something. Can I just ask this one to you? We can talk, talk to, to everybody now. Let me ask you this question. Are you a kind of leader type or very happy to work with people in a group? Kind of. Well, you may have noticed in your school because some people are, yes, huh? I would like to work in a group. You're not well. Okay, that's fine. Anybody else, you know? Yeah? You'd like to work in a group? And some people are more comfortable in leading, others are not. Uh, and some people are happy to lead a project, others are happy to be part of that project. Um, because sometimes some people think that they are not able to lead or to do things. Now I'm going to tell you about one man who worked for nearly six decades, no, with 60 years or maybe more in Israel. I wonder if anybody can guess this person. He was a prophet and he worked for a long, long time. Many guesses. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, and he worked for a long time, yes? First, there's another one. Just before Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, there's one more book. What after, 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 sorry, after Isaiah. Jeremiah, yes, Jeremiah. Jeremiah worked for a long, long time in Israel as a prophet. But when God asked him to come, that he can help him to spread his word or speak to people, do you know what he said? Again, I guess it's, no? Well, just to help you, let me just read it out to you. Jeremiah chapter 1. This is what, this was his response. When God said to him, starting from verse 4, if you want to follow them, you can turn to verse 730, but you don't have to. It says, The Lord said to me, I chose you before I gave you life, and before you were born, I selected you to be a prophet to the nations. I answered, as Jeremiah saying, I answered, Sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say that, you are too young, but go to the people I send you to and tell them everything that I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I will be with you to protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. So that was Jeremiah's response. I am too young. And how many of you say, I am too young, I can't do it. I don't know how to speak. Well, many of us can't say that. I'm too young. I can't say that to you. Uh, but remember the times. You know, age is not, you know, in this regard. Anything that you want to start, anything you, uh, new, you think you're too young to do that. I mean, if you want to change your area where you're comfortable, if you have to do something different from that, you feel too young, too young, not confident. And that was the thing with Jeremiah. And God said to him, come and I will help you. He said, I'm too young, I don't know how to speak. How many of us are afraid of speaking in front of people? In a group? Quite a number of people. It's not easy to stand up and talk. Um, I remember when I was a teenager and I was asked to lead a, a meeting, I stood up. I couldn't face people, I always was looking at me. I couldn't face people. I was shaking like a leaf. But that can happen. Jeremiah said the same thing. But the good thing is, God said to him, Do not be afraid, I will be with you. I think that's the promise that we need to take really serious because God did help him and he can help us too. When we th see things that we should do, but we are kind of timid and scared of not taking the risk, remember that God is with you. Age doesn't really count much because God can use any, uh, any, any, anyone, big or small. I remember a good story, a, a, a girl called Anna Taylor, I read this story. 
uh, back in 2012, she was only five or six. As she was walking the street, she saw somebody eating something out of the big bag. And that moment, she felt that God is saying to her, she needs to do something for the homeless or, you know, somebody. And she started working on that. Within two years, she collected or raised how money? Well, how much money do you think? <coughs> two million dollars within two years. <coughs> and that set up a, a, a charity called Ladybug. And that has helped many, many homeless people. So don't think you're too young. God is with you. He can use you to do wonderful things. So remember this promise. When you think you can't do it, you're scared, remember this, I will be with you to protect you. Okay, can we do that? Okay, let's sing together then. Because he was afraid to look. 
my God. Then the Lord said, I have seen how cruelly my people are being treated in Egypt. I have heard them cry out to be rescued from their slave drivers. I know all about their suffering. And so I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of Egypt to a spacious land, one which is rich and fertile, and which the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. I have seen and have indeed heard the cry of my people, and I see how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now I am sending you to the king of Egypt, so that you can lead my people out of his country. Amen. And may God bless the reading of the soul Lord. Before we hear second reading, let us uh, sing together, Mission Christ number 444. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. We will sing the first four verses and then the second reading. Thank you. 
prices. Depends on that surprise, doesn't it? Well, if you say that it depends on surprise, then I'm with you. Uh, if it's a good surprise, pleasant surprise, yes. But if it's a bad one, no. Emphatic no. No one likes, I'm sure, bad surprises. I have to say, I do like giving surprises. Uh, so sometimes the bad ones. You can ask my family members. <laughs> they call them more kind of frights. <laughs> but, you know, I like to know things in advance, you know, uh, so that I can think of these things um, a, a slow kind of learner, if you like. I just want to soak in things and then and think about them. Uh, however, uh, as I said, um, I like to give prize surprises. But sometimes surprises come whether you like them or not. Whether you can <coughs> expect them or not. Just as we have heard in our uh, reading, or both readings, you see, the burning bush experience uh, does not happen apart from or in spite of everyday life, but in the midst of life. That's what life is. It never fails to surprise you. And sometimes these surprises come while we are keeping the flocks, so to speak, as Moses was. That's what Moses was doing when the surprise came to him. It happened to him. He was keeping the flock of his father-in-law. Father uh, and that was nothing that he was doing some, uh, you know, uh, out of the, the, the ordinary. It was an ordinary day, routine things that he was doing in his life. The same thing that he did every day, every week, maybe for years. This day started, um, especially uh, for Moses, this day started unlike any other day. The shepherd, expecting nothing of the or uh, out of the ordinary, he thought he was going to go and do the job as he did every day, tending the sheep. Although I would wish to think, or like to think that he would have liked uh, something different to break the monotony of the day or the work that he was doing. We do sometimes, don't we? If we are so used to doing the same thing again and again, we would wish to do something big or something out of the ordinary happens. You see, after the 40 years of sheep tending, Moses' life had become all too predictable. He knew all the, perhaps, the grazing places, all the places where the water was, so he could take his sheep. He could know, he could know the, 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 every location in that desert, and perhaps could remember the way uh, while his eyes closed, in a way. The desert is, you know, uh, is really very deceptive in terms of uh, finding your way. But because he was so used to it, I think for him it was kind of a piece of cake, going every day for miles and miles and then bring back his sheep. Burning bushes show up as we keep doing the same thing, doing the routine works, everyday life, perhaps marriage, parenting, work, friendships. You know, churches, <coughs> every Sunday we come do the worship, the same thing. Reading the news perhaps, household tasks, it could be anything. So there was another day, another thorny bush. It was just like millions of others in the desert. There was nothing unique about the bush that was burning. And the fact that 
A bird was not unusual either. You know, the spontaneous combustion often will burn a bush in the desert. That's nothing unique. So the fact that there is a burning bush is not what catches Moses' attention. What catches Moses' attention is, attention is that, that the bush was burning, but it didn't burn out. That was the thing that catch, uh, 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 catches his attention. It was, you know, kind of not turning it into ashes. There may be what crackling crackle sounds, but he couldn't see it burnt out. Maybe it was, perhaps, I don't know, it, it was for uh, 10 minutes, 15, half an hour, 3 hours, 4 hours, 6 hours, I don't know. For how long this bush burned? We are not told about the time. But it was burning, but not burning out. And out of curiosity, Moses turns aside to get a closer look at this bush. Why that bush was not burning out? So as he goes closer, out of it comes a voice. Now, I, I, I want to imagine, you know, that must have freaked him out. <laughs> that would have been a kind of real surprise, shocking surprise. Not a good one, I wouldn't like it. I, I remember once we went to Edinburgh Festival. And you know these uh, uh, statues standing? Right? Uh, some people don't realize that they are real. You know? And as you walk by, and suddenly they speak, a country is getting a real shock. And I, I want to imagine that when Moses went closer and something spoke, that would have given him a, a shock of his life. But here's the point. Once God saw the break in Moses' concentration from his daily work, he spoke to Moses. He spoke to Moses. And I think that is the, 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 the point we need to think about. We need to take time for God <coughs> to speak to us or speak to you. We are in such a quick pace, uh, time living, you know, everything is fast from gadgets to our appointment to, from one meeting to another, from one thing to another. And that happens even in our private prayer time. We are quick to do two, three minutes prayer and run. Or sometimes it happens that we have a long prayer list. And we keep speaking, keep speaking, finish and go, and then complain after years and say, God has not listened to me, has not answered my prayer. Well, God's response could be, you didn't give me a chance to speak. <coughs> Take time to listen to God. We sing sometimes, don't we? Be still for the presence of the Lord. But we're talking. Inside. Think about something else. Our relationship with God becomes just a bunch of rules that we manipulate for our own agenda. We bring our own agenda in prayers too. And so here in this story, the first thing that I want to emphasize is take time to hear what God is saying. God says to Moses, Moses, Moses. And I want to imagine God was not shouting out. Otherwise, he would have heard from a distance. <coughs> As he gets closer, God speaks in a gentle voice. Listening is as important as doing. God can surprise us by speaking to us in place or places we are so familiar with, but least expect Him to speak to us. It could be your home, it could be workplace, anything, even church. You know, I sometimes say, listening, you know, if you can't listen, if you can't take instructions, 
you can't give instructions. So the art of listening comes first before you're able to lead and give instructions. So here Moses is kind of learning this new skill. God is speaking to him, making him listen. And we should do the same. But that's another point that I want to, to, to come to, to break to. That's the kind of offshoot. Here's the main point I want to, to talk about. And that is that God surprises Moses. God says, I have observed the misery of my people. I have seen their suffering and I have come down to free them from their oppression. I've heard their cry. He says, I know they're suffering. Now, that sounds like they're getting somewhere. So you went first shock, Moses recorded from first shock, and then God says, look, I'm going to deliver my people from Egypt. That's a good thing. I would have clapped, said, well done. That's what I was trying to do many years ago. And now we come to the point. But here comes a real surprise. While perhaps Moses was in the euphoria and be very happy about this good news, God says, So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of the land. Come. That's an even bigger surprise for him than when God spoke from the bush. Moses must have been completely shocked that God would want him to go. Look at verse 11. We didn't look at the verse, uh, that, that verse. We just read 10 verses. But in verse 11, Moses says, I am nobody. How can I go to the king and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? We will look at these ver verses in the next uh, a couple of weeks. Because I'm planning to talk about this chapter for the next a week or two. My question is, why is Moses not excited at the prospect of this opportunity once in a lifetime? Man is being asked to go and raise the whole nation. Why is he not excited about it? <coughs> I think because he had a vivid memory of doing the same thing many years ago, 40 years ago, now God is saying to him to do the same thing. He had that memory sitting there, but at that time he failed miserably. He can remember God uh, doing God's will in his way. He can remember doing God's will without asking him. Asking him his directions. He was trying to do the things in his own power. But now he had left the past behind. He had moved on. He had made a new life uh, out here in the desert. He has acquired new skills. He has learned to live without his loved ones around. He has changed his job. You see, he has made a painful transition from being a prince to being a shepherd. You see, it's so hard it is for somebody to come down from that status to, to ordinary uh, status, but even lower than ordinary. See, remembering the past is too painful, uh, painful for him. <coughs> Thinking about that time is one thing. Going there again is even harder. Perhaps he thinks he is a failure himself. And so Moses can't digest the thought that God wants to use him. 
No, he says, I am no <coughs> You see, Moses must, must, must have been thinking, God, you want to send me? Wait a minute. Don't you remember I'm the one who failed terribly the first time? Don't you remember? God says, I never forgot you. I don't need to remember that. I have been training you throughout these years. And Moses says, but God, I am the one who blows it. And God says, you are also the one who has been forgiven. You see, one of, you know, some of us are so convinced that because of the things in the past, the blunders that we have perhaps uh, done or committed in the past, we will never be used by God again. If that's the case, look at verses 7, 8, and 10. God is going to deliver his people by sending the person who thinks he's a failure. <coughs> Moses is going to give existence to God's call for deliverance. Moses is to make real and enact God's desire for his people. What if? That's what God is working in our life. He wants to work in our life. Maybe He is speaking to you right now. Or has been speaking to you for quite some time continually. But we continue to resist and say, I'm nobody, I'm not going to do that. You see, the burning bush story is one of call and response. Something is being called for. It could be you, it could be me. And I can't help but believe that call and response is also the story of our lives, each one of us. Something is being asked by God. He's asking us to do. You see, Moses has no idea what the, what the day held for him at that day. There was no message in the cloud, there was no some extraordinary sign around. He didn't sit down and ask God, when do you show me this, then I will do this. No. Ordinary day, things happen. There was no hint that his life was going to change, and change it did. It is interesting that when God calls us back, or calls us <coughs> to do something for him, uh, more often than not, it arrives on an ordinary day. You see, we may have been doing something in the kitchen, we may have been praying, but just like every day. But when it comes, it always takes us by surprise. I remember there are many stories in the Bible. I remember the story of David. Uh, that's the most familiar one. Remember Moses, when Moses, uh, David was anointing to be the king, it was an ordinary day for him. He was out in the field and he gets a call from his father and say, come home early. He must have been wondering what, what, what happened. And as he comes home, he saw Prophet Samuel sitting there waiting for him. And he comes in, he anoints him and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. That would have been a surprise. A pleasant one. I don't know if that's pleasant one or not. You will find out. It comes on an ordinary day. This may be the day for us. But let me not finish with this uh, a very historical event that may bring this point closer to home. In 1630, an incredible revival broke out in Scotland. John Livingston had been asked to preach to the Kirk of Shorts. And it was the night before he was to speak. What was so unusual about the request is that John Livingston was a failure. He was not a good preacher. He spent the whole night in prayer, wondering what was 
he going to preach then <coughs> eight in the morning just hours before he was due to preach he was scared and so afraid and he wanted to quit because he thought he is going to blow another assignment and the spirit of god again pushed him led him to his study and he opened his bible and this is what came to him ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 to 26 it says i will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean from all your idols and everything else that has defiled you. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. <coughs> you see, because that day was a sunny day, it was decided to, to hold the service outdoor outside. They forgot that they were in Scotland. <laughs> And it's obvious happened, you know, you know, the sky darkened and uh, it began to rain. John Livingston didn't stop, he continued. And as he finished his sermon, 500 people trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that day. To John Livingston, it looked like just another uh, ordinary day, another assignment with the fear to just ruin this opportunity once again. But God had another idea. He said, it is said Martin Luther was at the Diet of Worms. You know, do you know the Diet of Worms what happened there? And I don't have time to, to go into detail, but what happened was he was called to, to, to come and uh, uh, give an account of, of for his uh, writings and the kind of reformation, the reason. So he was to appear about uh, in front of many Roman Catholic uh, top officials. And so while he was sitting there, one of his friends whispered, said, are you not afraid? Luther, Luther replied. He said, the thing that I fear more than Pope is self. It's not the outside fear. It is fear inside and so for Moses, it was an ordinary day. God surprised him with his call. The fear perhaps was not from the outside, it was inside. For him, perhaps it was painful to remember what had happened in the past. His past was holding him back. But God said to him, as I say to children, God said, I will be with you. How about us? Are you afraid because you you perceived inadequacy or because of real inability you think <coughs> you're a failure? Or perhaps you have done or attempted something and it went horribly wrong and now we think how can God forgive me and how can He now use me? Or like, like Zacchaeus in our second reading, <coughs> we are involved in something that has been or is not popular and therefore people don't like us or even hate us. Zacchaeus was disliked and hated. In our own eyes we think, I have let down my own people and even God. If that's the case, God is saying this. You are forgiven. I have loved you always and I have loved you so much that I have sacrificed my own son for you. I have paid the highest price for you. And now come. I want to use you. And remember, I will be with you. And so I would say this morning, don't let the past or the present Hinder from doing what God wants us to do. Rather than Moses, who says I'm nobody, say this, Here I am, holy of God. Let us sing together this hymn. And uh, while we do so, we are with the audience.
Now as you go from here, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit continue to be with you now and forever. Amen.